Victoria Regional Health Centre's Community Lecture Series, Concussion and Evening with Experts. My name is Chris Martin. I'm an emergency and intensive care physician, as well as the Director of Medical Education at RVH. I get to be your host and the moderator for this exciting event tonight. The Community Lecture Series are educational events that we put together about two to three times a year, similar to a hospital grand rounds, but designed for the community. We choose important health topics and bring in experts from around the country to give you the best information possible so that you can make informed decisions on your health and your life. Now, this is our largest event to date, and uh, we have the, our most impressive panel of experts ever. And I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm very excited about the next uh, hour and a bit because it's going to be awesome. Concussions are an important topic which we felt we needed to cover uh, as part of this community lecture series. They've always been part of sports, but for years they were underappreciated, underdiagnosed, and undertreated. We now know the serious nature of concussions in sport and the implications they have not only on quality of life, but potentially on life itself. March 6th, Ontario passed Rowan's Law, which was to protect amateur athletes and educate coaches, players, and parents on the severity of head injuries. Anyone who plays sports needs to know the information you're going to hear tonight. We're going to discuss up-to-date prevention, diagnosis, management, and the future of concussions. Now, before I introduce our panel, I want to give everyone just an idea of how we've kind of structured the evening. I'm going to ask a series of questions to our expert panel to get things going. Hopefully, that discussion will answer many of the questions you may have about concussions and Rowan's Law. After that, we have a short little presentation, and then it's all yours. With two mics at the front, and we want people to come down and ask our panel questions and get a good discussion generated. I know there's a lot of people, but don't be shy. I guarantee if someone here has a question, there's a dozen other people who have the same question, so ask away. I'd now like to welcome our speakers. I'm going to do a short little intro for each one, and later on in the discussion, you'll learn more about them. To my immediate left is Mr. Gordon Stringer. Gordon is a brain injury awareness advocate and the driving force behind Rowan's Law. He has come to us all the way from PEI to speak tonight, and you're going to learn more about Gordon and his daughter Rowan in a little bit, so I'm not going to steal any thunder. To his left is Stephanie Cowell. Stephanie is the manager of Knowledge Translation for Parachute Canada, a national charity founded in 2012 dedicated to injury prevention. Stephanie has led Parachute's nat uh, national projects to improve concussion prevention, recognition, and management across Canada, including the publication of, of the first ever Canadian guidelines on concussion in sport. So, next we have Paul Hunter, the Director of Nat National Development for Rugby Canada. Paul works across the country with all levels of rugby and has been a national leader on coaching, training, and development. Paul is the lead for Rugby Canada's Play Smart Initiative and is a member of the Rowan's Law Advisory Committee. To Paul's left, we have Dr. Shannon Bowman. Shannon is a family and sports medicine physician here in Barrie. She's the medical director for Concussion North and a member of the expert advisory committee for the Canadian guidelines on concussion in sport. Finally, our last panel uh, expert probably doesn't need an introduction, but he's going to get one. Um, first overall pick in 1991, one of the most exciting and dominant hockey players ever. He scored 372 goals, 493 assists, and 760 games. He's won a Hart Trophy, a seven-time All-Star, played in three World Junior Championships, winning two gold and a three-time Olympian, winning silver in 92 and a gold in 2002. As impressive as his accomplishments on the ice were, he's very special amongst elite athletes in that his, perhaps his greatest accomplishments and positive impact are occurring after he retired. He's a philanthropist with a focus on preventing and treating concussions. On the day he retired from pro hockey, he donated $5 million to the London Health Science Centre towards the Lindros Legacy Research Building. He's the honorary chair for See the Line, which is a community symposium on concussion awareness and research, and it's in its 10th year. He's been an advocate behind Rowan's Law and the NHLPA challenge to raise over $3 million for concussion research. As an advocate for player safety and sports, he's testified to the House of Commons Special Committee on Sport-Related Head Injuries. And now, he's here and buried with us. Please welcome all of our guests, and including Eric Lindros. I'm doing whatever it takes, stopping and nothing, I'm up in your face, shaking it off, no matter the cost, I'm feeling the win, I'm taking it all, I'm paving the way with the sweat and the blood, I'm at the top, rising above, I want the gold, give me the rush, Queen Midas, I got the touch, I'm pushing, 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 I'm pushing,
Okay, we're now going to start off our panel discussion. And I'm going to start with a series of questions. Again, don't worry, you have lots of time for the audience to ask questions after. We're going to start a discussion with Gord Stringer, and he gets a two part question to start off with. Gord, how did the concussion safety legislation, known as Rowan's Law, come to pass? And could you please tell us all about Rowan? Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, I want to echo uh, the initial uh, comment on uh, how many people are here. This is this is amazing. I've I've done community events before, and uh, we haven't had a turnout like this. So this this is really incredible. Uh, good on you guys. <laughs> so I'll tell you all about Rowan. <laughs> That's. Uh, we have the yeah, slides queued up. Oh, uh, on the right side, sorry. Yeah, right there. Next one. There. So, since May of 2013, I've done a lot of these. And I found out at the beginning, the focus was always on the story about her death. And after a while, it kind of got to me. I, I, I'd come up and I'd go, why am I always talking about her death? Um, she was so more, so much more, <clears throat> excuse me, than just her death. So I started to incorporate a little bit more about, about her. Um, so I hope you'll indulge me for a few minutes. Um, she came into the world kicking and screaming. She was our second child. Um, Kathleen and I often commented over the years that had we had Rowan first, we probably would not have had a second. <laughs> very much unlike her sister. Her sister was very pleasant and docile and cooperative and listened to instruction and uh, didn't want to rock the boat. And Rowan was other end of the spectrum, challenging. Uh, you can have two cookies, I want four. Um, okay, you can have two and a half, you can have two and a little one, no, I want five. And you know, those kind of discussions. He was a great negotiator. Well, not a great, she was an annoying negotiator, is what she was. <clears throat> but, um, you know, she was definitely her own person. She wasn't one who was going to uh, out of peer pressure, once she made her mind up, she was, uh, she was on a path, and uh, that did serve her well. We tried not to squash that too much, but uh, it does get annoying at times. Um, you'll see in a couple of those pictures, she has uh, Michaela, her doll, which we still have. Uh, Michaela was, uh, she and Michaela were joined at the hip for way too many years. It was, uh, it got to a point where we kind of had to say, and yeah, might well, you not know, be good to go to your hockey game with Michaela on your hip. So um, maybe you should leave Michaela behind. Uh, that was a tough sell, though. <clears throat> um, because she was so um, energetic, we got her involved in all kinds of sports. She, uh, over the years, she was into soccer. She played ringette for uh, about 14 years, I think. No, well, 13, maybe. Um, got all the way up to double A. She represented Ontario uh, at the national championships. Um, she snowboarded. She played lacrosse with the boys until the boys got too big. Um, actually, she played beyond when they got too big, but so she finally realized that, hey, maybe this isn't a good idea when I've got a six foot two guy coming in on me on defense. Uh, I'm going to lose that battle pretty quickly. So she made the choice her on her own to, uh, to stop playing lacrosse, but um, snowboarding, rugby, football, uh, she played and tried just about everything. Um, but that kept her, kept her on the straight and narrow as far as we know. She had a real affinity for animals and, uh, and babies and children. Children seemed to be drawn to her. Maybe it was her energy. I don't know what it was. She, she effused something that uh, attracted kids. She had got a lot of babysitting jobs because the kids seemed to really like her. And so it was a, 
that was a big part of her life. She had, uh, her plan was to, we had the Children's Hospital in, uh, in Ottawa. She volunteered there at the cancer ward for the kids. And uh, she had been accepted at Ottawa University. She was gonna go in through nursing and she wanted to work at CHEO with the kids again. <clears throat> and of course, shopping was a big thing in her life. Um, these are a few pictures from when we took them to New York. And uh, no, they didn't want to go see the Statue of Liberty or the museums or the Bronx Zoo or anything else. No, they wanted to go shopping. So it was, we spent most of our time shopping. I, I spent most of my time outside looking at things. And <laughs> <laughs> they came out whenever they needed the credit card. <laughs> So in May of 2013, um, there was a period of six days. She was on her high school rugby team. Um, she was captain of the team. Uh, it was a team that had just started again. They, they hadn't had girls rugby for a number of years and they decided to start up the program. So, um, and she was one who had played club rugby so she actually had some experience so they started up the team. They had some uh, preseason games on, uh, on the Friday. They had uh, three games in the afternoon. She was pulled out of the last game, but she'd been playing all day, so we didn't think it was anything unusual. Um, it wasn't until later that we learned she had actually taken a hit, and that's why they took her out. We just thought she'd been playing all day. They finally decided to give her a break. The, the uh, game was well in hand. And, Anyway, she, she had apparently taken a hit and they, and they took her out, but she didn't say anything to us. The coaches didn't say anything to us. Um, Saturday, she had, uh, she had a headache, but again, she was a kid, she got headaches. So have, Rowan having a headache was not a, anything unusual that popped up on your radar. Um, so she took Tylenol or Advil, Tylenol, whatever. Um, it seemed to go away. Uh, Sunday, she was fine. We had a family gathering, she seemed normal. Uh, she had a game on Monday. We weren't there, but apparently she took uh, she got a knee to the head in Monday's game. But she came home with this huge bruise on her thigh. So of course that's the visible injury. That's where the focus goes, and we're all worried about the bruise on her thigh. No mention of a hit to the head. Nothing else. Um, so we we're focused on icing the leg and you know, making sure she was looking after that and all this kind of stuff. Um, Tuesday, she went and took her driver's test, which again, in hindsight, was a, another flag because she, she failed her driver's test. And I, I was surprised by it. Um, I thought she was actually a pretty good driver, so it kind of shocked me that, uh, that she had failed. But uh, during the inquest into her death, they had the driver examiner come in as one of the witnesses. And he said uh, he had to go back and pull the file and everything. And uh, his testimony was such that he said, if I didn't know that, and, and this was a guy that had like 20, 25 years experience. He said, if I, if I didn't know that this was a 17 year old kid, I would have looked at, it ex at this ex exam and my assumption from my experience would be that it was an elderly person who had come in to take their test to try and keep their driver's license because the judgment was so off. Uh, she was bad decision making um, and that's what failed her. So that was kind of a, a key thing where at the moment you're not really thinking about it. You have no other information. It's just, you know, kids fail their driver's tests. <clears throat> uh, Wednesday, she went in. Uh, I took her into school, I dropped her off at the front door and she had a game that night and I said, you know, your knee's still looking pretty bad. Um, maybe you should sit this one out. And it was, oh, come on, Dad. You know, I've had injuries before. This is no big deal. I've rested a couple of days. Um, still no mention of any hits to the head or anything else. Uh, she seemed relatively herself. She was a little grumpy at the fact that I suggested she not play, but uh, that wasn't unusual either. So um, she ended up playing that game. And... Uh, and during that game, she took a swing tackle from an opposing player, uh, which in rugby is not 
not doesn't jive with the laws of rugby. So um, she went airborne. She land. She was carrying the ball. So heaven forbid that she let go of the ball. She wouldn't let go of the ball. But then her head took the uh, the brunt of the landing, and she lost consciousness on the field and uh, never regained it. She was taken to uh, Chio and. Uh, Five days later, she was uh, pronounced brain dead. The thing that I go back to about the game is that the, and not just the hit, but the player that um, initiated the tackle had done the same thing to another player about 10 minutes before in the same game. And the official, instead of removing the, that player from the game, which my understanding is they should have at least given her a 10 minute penalty, if not ejected her from the game, merely gave her a warning and said, you know, don't do that again. And then 10 minutes later, she did, did the very same thing to Rowan. Um, so that's just another, another point that comes to mind around, you know, uh, when you have laws of a game, rules of a game, and you have officials, the officials need to enforce the rules. And when they enforce the rules, we shouldn't be berating them for enforcing the rules. Um, so that's, that's the, the story of Rowan up to the point of, of her demise. Um, I say a lot of this with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, because when you're in, when we were in that time, we didn't know a lot of the stuff that we knew now. We didn't know about the hits that she had. We didn't, you know, we had no insight into her failure on, of the driver's test. We had no knowledge of uh, what happened with the officials and uh, this kind of stuff. It, you know, she, she was unconscious. She went to the hospital, she passed away. Um, we knew it was a head injury, but uh, beyond that, we really didn't know any of the story behind it. She was, uh, she was an organ donor. She, when she came home with uh, her, um, her first learner's permit, she um, signed the papers to uh, donate her organs. Uh, my wife Kathleen was a, or is a uh, uh, hemodialysis nurse, so she's very pro-organ donation. She's seen lots of patients that needed kidneys for years and, and couldn't get them. So um, she often talked about it. And so it was important with our kids, found it was important to do that. That being said, so Rowan donated uh, all of her organs, tissues, uh, her eyes, skin, whatever they could take were all donated. Um, so that was really our focus when, after she initially passed. We uh, were really out on the circuit promoting you know, organ donation and the benefits of it from a, from a donor family per, per, per perspective. Um, and we've had the good fortune. We've actually met the woman who, uh, who received her lungs, uh, one of her lungs, no, both of her lungs. Um, and that's... Uh, that was a pretty amazing experience. Um, she was a young mother uh, who has now uh, had the opportunity to see her grandchildren um, as a result. And uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty gratifying uh, to see the, the impact it's had on, uh, on her life. <clears throat> but it was about 18 months um, after Rowan passed, uh, I got a call from the coroner's office in Ottawa. Uh, they called to tell me that uh, Dr. Charles Tatter, who's uh, probably Canada's foremost authority on uh, concussions and uh, brain surgery, and I, I mean, he's in his 80s now, but he's been at it for 50 or more years. He's, this guy's pretty incredible, but uh, they'd had a call from him, and he wanted an inquest into her death. And... So they gave me his information and I called him up and I said, like, what, you know, what, it's like been 18 months, what's, <laughs> where are you coming from on this? And he said, well, I just want to learn everything that happened around it so that we can make sure 
that it doesn't happen again. I thought, okay, that sounds pretty noble to me, so let's, let's do this. Um, so about six months later, they had the inquest into her death in Ottawa. Um, it was over about 10 days. And uh, through that, they came out with 49 uh, recommendations from the, the inquest jury around um, things that happened, how they could uh, pre be prevented from happening again, uh, why, they, why they happened, why they shouldn't have happened, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I left that thinking, well, this is wonderful. I mean, I've got, I got 49 recommendations. That here we are. Is it, the answer's here. And uh, I started doing some research and was very disappointed with the fact that nobody had to do anything with these recommendations. <laughs> it was like, we've gone through all this, and now you're telling me that... Uh, these could collect dust in a coroner's office somewhere and nobody's going to ask two questions about it. So I, I went to our local MPP um, about a week later and I walked into her office and I'd never met her before and I walked in and introduced myself and she said, yeah, I know who you are. And uh, I said, well, I've got 49 jury recommendations and I don't want them collecting dust somewhere, so you gotta tell me um, how, how I can get somebody to notice these and uh, do something about it. So I worked with Lisa for a little while and we came up with the idea of, she was in opposition at the time, so you know, we put forward a, a private member's bill, but what she did was she engaged uh, a member from the Liberal Party and a member from the NDP as well. So it was uh, a co-sponsored private member's bill from all three parties in the legislature. And uh, it went through, ultimately. Um, one thing I learned through that process was uh, there's a saying that I, I heard various times during my career. I, I spent my career in the federal government as a regulator and lawmaker and etc. And uh, one thing I heard during that process was uh, things you never want to see being made are sausages and laws. And um, I experienced that firsthand from the other side with, uh, with the political machinations going on at Queen's Park and uh, the horse trading and uh, I'm not going to do this unless you do that, and I don't want to do that today because you did this to me four weeks ago, and uh, it was just, it was ugly. And, uh, but we got through, we got through it all, and ultimately it passed unanimously in the legislature. And uh, what came out of it was, uh, they call it the first concussion law in Canada. That was another thing that was amazing to me, was that the United States is actually ahead of us on this, which is, you know, when you, when you come from my background in laws and regulations, um, being behind the United States is like the worst thing you can possibly be because <laughs> they, they, they are like the lowest common denominator when it comes to you know, health and safety and environment and everything else. It's like, you know, you're behind the United States, wow, that's really bad. Um, but Canada had no, no laws around uh, concussion, and whereas every state in the United States had their own um, laws. Now, albeit they are more, a much more litigious society down there, and a lot of the laws are butt-covering laws, as they call them, but they do exist, and, and they do have elements of uh, um, you know, player welfare, citizen welfare, etc., in there, uh, as well as the you know, I did this so you can't sue me kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, it was a bit of a shocker that Canada had nothing, uh, nothing on the books on this. So they called this the first concussion law in Canada. But what it really was was a law that mandated the government to set up a committee to tell them how to <laughs> implement the 49 recommendations. So the first concussion law was merely a law to set up a committee. Um, but that's okay. It's all part of the it's all part of the story. So anyway, they they set up the committee a few months later, and we worked away for about a year, and uh, we came out with um, 
the Rollins Law Advisory Committee report, and within it was 20, were 21 action items, which we felt addressed all of the 49 recommendations that came out of that jury. Um, the first of those action items was to create Rowan's Law in Ontario. And the government did that very quickly. Um, Ro the Rowan's Law was passed um, unanimously again uh, in the legislature. Uh, within, it was within six months of the report, which again was pretty, pretty speedy when you I'm used to working in a federal system where it took four years to get a recommendation to maybe think about putting a regulation in place that he got actually got a law done in uh, six months. That was, that was pretty impressive. Um, so that's the first of the 21 action items down. Um, other items included um, changing the edu uh, adding to the educational curriculum a component in the physical health and education areas to actually talk about concussion. To that point, um, it had been an area, a, a suggested area that, that teachers in those areas might think about talking about if they thought it might be a good idea. Um, whereas now it has become part of the curriculum that must be addressed. Um, there's now a Rowan's Law Day in Ontario, uh, the last Wednesday of each September, which was actually quite a good timing point because most school teams haven't been uh, established yet and you know, hockey tryouts and whatnot are getting geared up in that area and that's a big one for, uh, for Canada. And, um, so it, it, it's pretty good timing and again, it's, it's involvement of schools and the medical system, uh, clinics, hospitals, etc. A lot of them jump on board and have a day of uh, awareness about concussions, signs, symptoms, um, recognition, what to do, who to talk to, what to look at with your friends, etc. So um, those have been, you know, good good things that have uh, that have come along. Uh, regulations came in this past July around uh, sports clubs, uh, provincial sports organizations, and sports clubs having to have uh, concussion protocols in place. They have to train their officials, their administrators, parents, and players all have to sign off that. Uh, they're going to abide by the codes of conduct and the, uh, the concussion education that's provided by their various sports uh, organizations. Um, so that's a, that's a good step forward as well. Um, but one thing I will say, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with what the, the government has done. They, they, you know, the Liberal government brought in the, the Rowan's Law started the process and the conservatives have taken over and they've they have actually maintained their commitment uh, it's it's one it's a good thing that it was a an all party uh unanimous thing in the legislature because all the parties are on board with this and and the conservative government has um has kept on with it um one thing I will say, and I don't mean for it to sound negative in any way, but they really have addressed the low-hanging fruit at this point. Um, there's a lot of tougher action items in there that they are committed to address that have not yet been uh, tackled. Um, things like um, upping the education within the medical profession. Um, you know, ensuring that family doctors know how to properly triage and can get people into their offices and out of their offices in the 70% of cases where family practitioners should be able to handle the case. Um, addressing things like um, having centers of excellence in the province where you will have multidisciplinary uh, clinics under uh, medical doctor's direction that can handle the 30% of the cases that are long-term chronic uh, issues. You know, establishing them and funding them under the OHIP program is, is another recommendation that, that still needs to be addre uh, addressed. Um, 
upping the education of other healthcare professionals that are involved in treatment, your physiotherapists, your athletic therapists, occupational therapists, um, upgrading their education so that they can um, be uh, participate in them and maybe look at the OHIP coding for them as well so that it's not just people that have private insurance that or have to pay it out of pocket that they can actually get the treatment that they need from these various people um, without having either out of pocket or private insurance it should be covered under the OHIP banner so these are other things that have, have been recommended um, and we have a, a committee now, a, a lot of us from the advisory committee have been carried over to the working group that are, um, I will say, monitoring the government. But I look at it from my perspective as our job is to hold their feet to the fire. Um, they've got 21 recommendations that government has made a commitment to address, and it's our intention that they will be addressed. And I think that's a very important job for us as, as the working group to uh, to ensure that they do get addressed because this is not um, it's not a sports issue; it's a public health issue. Um, you know, we ask 50, you know, 50, 60 percent of concussions to occur in sport, but there's you know domestic abuse, there's slipping and falling on ice, there's automobile accidents, there's so many work accidents so many other areas where concussions happen that um, yeah, it, it's a public health issue and it's one that's uh, sorely addressed in a lot of cases right now. So that's, that's part, of, uh, part of what we're there to do as well is to, to make sure that um, these things get looked at. And uh, it's... What we concluded at the committee level was we really need a cultural change around concussion. Um, for so many years, it was cocoon therapy. It was, oh, you didn't get knocked out, so you don't have a concussion. Oh, come on, suck it up. You're just a bit dizzy. Just, you know, get on with your life. What are you whining about? Um, That didn't, that didn't service anyone well. It was a combination, I think, of, um, I'll use the term ignorance, but uh, that's probably a bit harsh, but it's just the knowledge wasn't there. But now that we have the knowledge and the knowledge is growing and um, in Canada, we're, I've learned so much over the last six years. We, Canada is one of the, top nations in the world, we're punching way above our weight in research in this area, in, in brain science in general, but concussions particularly. We've got amazing research centers here in Canada that are discovering great things. And we have to get these things into operationalizing them, in them into the system a lot quicker than, than what we are. Um, so. You know, that's another area that we want to push for is uh, supporting our researchers and, and getting their discoveries to practice in society um, a lot quicker than what they are now. So the opportunity is there, and I look at um, Rowan's Law here in Ontario as being a, a, a starting point for that, and we have to... We have a responsibility now in Ontario. We're, we're the leader in the nation. And um, this is something that should be adopted in every province and territory in Canada. And we need national leadership on it. Um, but we also need uh, provincial leadership. Um, I have commitment from the Ontario government that they will support. Uh, I've got initiatives going now in, uh, in PEI where I've subsequently uh, relocated. Um, but also there's interest uh, now in Newfoundland. I've, I've learned that Newfoundland is uh, very interested. There's been interest in Manitoba for a number of years. Uh, I've, got a, I've got groups in Alberta and BC also that, uh, that want to move things forward there. So I, I think there's a, there's a good opportunity to get a national uh, approach to this. And um, 
once they all start getting things in place, hopefully, I know it's always full of hope, but um, we should be able to, to get much better at what we're already, believe it or not, quite good at um, in you know, studying and, and improving care in this area. One of the biggest shortfalls is access, and that's where we really have to focus a lot of effort is uh, getting the right people trained and, and getting those access points to people that really need it. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I think I've probably talked to, oh, that's, I just threw that one in there. That's our, uh, that was the advisory committee group. Um, this is an interesting photo because uh, this meeting was actually scheduled on the anniversary of the day, one of, one of the anniversaries of the day that Rowan passed away. Um, so uh, Eric actually brought in uh, purple Rowan's Law t-shirts for all of us. Um, purple was her favorite color. So, uh, so on that day, we all put our shirts on and got down to work. Um, you can download this online on the Ontario government website. It's the uh, report from the committee. It tells you all the 21 action items that they're expected to deliver upon. And they, uh, they all revolve around legislation, surveillance, prevention, detection, management, and awareness. Um, those are the key themes that we, we brought out of it in all areas that are, I don't think any one is any more important than the other one. They're all a priority. And it's not a, we classified it as, it's not a menu that you pick and choose from. It's an all or nothing thing. If you, if you want the most bang for the buck you're going to put into this as a government, you've got to address all of these areas and all of the issues within them. Um, so you can't go picking and choosing. Uh, so at the working group level now, we're, uh, we're making sure they understand they're not supposed to be picking and choosing. <clears throat> And that's kind of the timeline of the path. Uh, the interesting thing for me was uh, it passed a passed third reading at Queen's Park on March 6th, and we got, <laughs> we got royal assent on March 7th. So I got a feeling somebody was greasing the wheels there um, because that's kind of unheard of. I know we always used to have to wait at least 90 days at the federal level to get uh, sign off from the, the final passing in Parliament to actually becoming a law. So uh, I'm pretty sure that somebody put the screws to the Lieutenant Governor and said, yeah, you're signing this today. Um, but that, that was pretty impressive. I was, I was quite happy with that. That's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Gord, thank you so much for uh, sharing Rowan's story with us and for you and your family's monumental work. Um, you know, thanks to her, thanks to you, uh, her legacy will make this sport safer and save lives. So thank you again. Okay, now we're going to start with our panel. And uh, my next question is for Stephanie uh, from Parachute Canada. Um, Stephanie, let's pretend I'm a hockey player who suffers a big open ice hit. And I lay on the ice for a moment, but I'm able to get up and I make my way slowly back to the bench. Now, if you're my coach, what are some of the signs and symptoms you're gonna look for to suspect, if you suspect I have a concussion? Sure, um, and, and that's a nice segue because now under Rowan's Law, hopefully all coaches in Ontario who are coaching youth in sport will be receiving concussion awareness education. So. Um, they will actually, uh, you know, be familiar with the signs and symptoms and, and know the answer to this themselves. Um, but certainly it's, it's knowing the signs to look for, knowing the symptoms to look for after a hit. So first you have the impact, okay? We're not going to be thinking about a concussion injury unless there's an impact first. So we talk about an open ice hit. What are some of the signs? Well, you have a player first that's been hit, that's slow to get up, 
um, that looks a little slow and unsteady, and, and something in your gut says this just doesn't look right. Um, and, and those are the first things that are going to cause maybe a suspicion within you. Um, and then you can use your training as well as tools that you can have on you um, to further explore signs and symptoms to look for. The most common reported symptom of concussion is headache, um, but there are a number of different symptoms that could be physical, like headache, dizziness, nausea. They could be um, mental, um, so not quite feeling clear in the head, feeling like you're thinking a little slowly. Um, and they could also cause some changes in behavior, such as um, you know, not answering questions appropriately, maybe feeling uh, emotions a little differently, maybe being a little irritable with your coach in that moment. Um, what's important to know as a coach as well is a lot of times your player is going to say, yeah, I'm fine. Um, a, they want to continue playing, they want to, to stay in the game, stay with the team, um, and also they may actually genuinely feel they're fine, um, but we're talking about an injury to the brain. So as a coach, as a parent, as anyone sort of in a responsible situation, when that happens, it's taking a step further to check it out. Okay, great. Now, you've asked me, and I said, yeah, I feel a little dizzy, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm good to go out there. So what now, what are you going to tell me to do as my coach? So the role you have as a coach, and again, as a parent or any other adult responsible for a youth in this case, the only thing we're asking you to do is suspect a possible concussion. We're not asking any of you in that moment to diagnose that a concussion has or hasn't happened. So again, your role is, do I have a suspicion here? If you recognize just one symptom, if you see one sign, that is enough. That's a suspected concussion. In that moment, your role is to either yourself or the person who, who is responsible for that decision to remove that player from play, and they shouldn't return that same day. And we're talking practice, training, workout, game. It doesn't matter the situation. They're removed from activity. And they should be checked out. In Ontario, that means an assessment by a medical doctor or a nurse practitioner. And this is really important. One thing they want to check out that it actually is a concussion and not potentially something worse or symptoms being caused by something else. Um, concussion, when we talk about the symptoms, they're quite general. So if we say headache, dizzy, Nauseous, that could be a lot of things, right? So the job of the assessment for one is to make sure that it's not, the symptoms aren't being caused by something else. So get it checked out, and from there you can move forward. If there's no concussion, um, if, if that diagnosis is there's no concussion there, then they can return to their normal activities. That's fine. There's no extra steps to follow. But if it is a concussion, then we need to get the parents, the player, their coaches, their teachers, the right information to gradually return to school, work, and sport activities safely. Okay, and now uh, let's say I'm after the game. What would be some things that you say, well, no, we actually have to, you have to go to the hospital right now. Like, what are those more severe things you're looking for? Yeah, there, there are certain symptoms that we call red flag symptoms. And um, a lot of these symptoms could come with concussion. But the challenge is they could also mean there might be a more serious injury happening and a serious injury that's caused for emergency. So when we're talking to parents and coaches and those who aren't licensed healthcare professionals, what we want to do is look for these red flags. And if there is, again, just one red flag, that's enough to say this could be a medical emergency. Let's call 911 or get them medical help right away. Um, it's a short list uh, of flags, I won't go through them all, but things like losing consciousness, um, tingling in the arms and legs, neck pain, vomiting multiple times over and over. Again, there are really great tools you can have on hand with you, so you don't have to memorize all this information. Um, there is a tool called the Concussion Recognition Tool. It's an international tool that we use also here in Canada, as well as um, there are apps like Parachute's Concussion Ed app that has a concussion recognition list built right in. So um, as long as you're aware that you should be looking for these things, you can have those tools with you at all times. If you see a red flag, get help just to be on the safe side. Okay, that's great. Uh, Dr. Bowman, 
Um, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation and hopefully you can help us walk through kind of how we go. So my daughter took an elbow in soccer. She was playing and uh, she was able to finish the game, you know, because there was only 10 minutes left. But after the game, she started complaining of headaches. And the next day, uh, her headaches got worse and she was at school and she actually had to come home early because she was having difficulty concentrating. Um, do you think she had a concussion and how would you diagnose this? Chris, I think uh, you raised a couple of quick points I just want to say is I hear it a lot. Thank you. Thanks. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that loud. Sorry. You raise a good, a good point. But I hear it a lot in my office, and I actually hear it almost every day. I have someone come in. I'm talking to them about their concussion and how it happened, and it's really not uncommon to hear, like you're mentioning your daughter, say, I took a hit, it was in the game, but you know what, I only had a few minutes left, so I continue to play the rest of the game. I really think we need to draw attention to this because this is happening a lot more than people realize. The idea of continuing to play through symptoms. It's not within themselves or recognizing and removing themselves from play, but kind of as Stephanie said, it's a really important point if someone's observing that that person could have had a hit to take them out. There's a great study that was done by Pittsburgh recently that was just published where they looked at 130 kids who were playing sports. Those ones that took themselves out immediately recovered by 18 days. Those that continued to play even 15 minutes longer took almost nearly double the time to recover in days, over 28 days. Those that continued to play about 20 minutes, 44 days was the length of recovery after injury. So how a concussion is managed in those first seconds, minutes, to days after concussion can actually greatly impact the length of time that person's in recovery after concussion. So it's very important if there's a possible concussion to recognize it and remove the athlete and also teach the signs and symptoms of concussion so athletes themselves are taking themselves out of the game. But it is still happening, and I hear it every day from athletes who continue to play in that game. And I do see the longer recovery times in these athletes when I see them and follow them for their concussion. So your question, Chris, about how would we then diagnose a concussion. So this athlete might be seen a couple ways. Their first person they see could be their family physician. It could be an emergency room physician, a walk-in clinic. Once they're seen, initially other causes of head injury are ruled out, looking for brain bleed, neck fracture. Based on their symptoms and their history, are there significant signs like a, symptoms they're experiencing, headache, dizziness, difficulty focusing, concentrating, trouble with sleep. So based on that person's symptoms, if it stemmed from an injury like the elbow to the head your daughter had, a, a proper examination, neurologic, neurologic examination, looking at the neck, looking at visual tracking, looking at some of the cranial nerve functions, looking at balance, would also be conducted during a medical exam. At that point, a diagnosis of a concussion could be made if the injury and the symptoms in the physical exam seem to support that. So without as assessing your daughter, it sounds like I would say very likely that she has a suspected concussion. Okay, and so I, you diagnosed her, you assessed her, and you diagnosed her with, with a concussion. So what would be her treatment plan? When can she go back to school? So treatment with concussions has evolved quite tremendously in the last couple of years, and I think one of the things on treatment and what needs to be said is there's been the old adage of rest alone will basically recover any concussion. And I really think that that idea is being challenged and evolved to say rest alone does not cure every concussion. If you look at the analogy of an idea of a snow globe, you have kind of the snow globe, you shake it up, you have all these symptoms initially, you kind of wait for them to settle. That's kind of one way of looking at some of the acute concussion. And luckily many of them do settle and we can gradually return to school, sport or work activities with some guidance. But there are those, the 25%, that don't just recover in a short amount of time. And that time period we use now is 14 days for adults and up to 30 days for youth under age 18. So when you look at a normal recovery time period, 
many people are continuing, or 25% continue to have symptoms that persist. In the acute phase, if your daughter does well within a short amount of time, she can gradually be looking at if the symptoms are headache, difficulty with focusing visually on the schoolwork, there can be recommendations made to reduce the amount of reading material. If there are symptoms, if she gets headache with exercise, you could start with lower levels of exercise and gradually build. So really you have to base it on that person's symptoms they have. In the cases that are become more persistent, it's definitely a more in-depth clinical assessment. At our clinic alone, I spend nearly an hour and a half looking at that person's symptoms, looking at the triggers they have, and those ones involve an interdisciplinary team looking at that because of the complexities. This idea up here that I have behind you is something that we use in our clinic to look at persistent symptoms. Each of these areas is one kind of realm or one kind of trajectory that some of the symptoms of concussion might fall under. So for example, headache, we mentioned it's one of the most common symptoms someone might get in a concussion. So over 70% will have persistent headaches. That could be a head pressure, it could be in various parts of the head, it could be the forehead, the top of the head, the back of the head. This could be triggered by sense of light, noise, we could have aspects we call cognitive fatigue. This is doing schoolwork or work and just getting really tired with the amount of work. It could be fogginess, feeling foggy when you trigger it with school-based activities. Vision is actually a very sensitive system to concussion. And I'm lucky within our team, we have a wonderful uh, neurooptometrist that work with us. This system involves difficulty with the focus system. This is the function of how the vision system works. This is how the eyes work together or team together. It affects reading, it affects how kids are studying at school, it affects your ability to do computers. The other half of that is the vestibular system. This is what happens when your eyes need to move quickly to scan or scroll, to look at an auditorium like this with a lot of people, those busy visual environments. It's kind of a dizziness, but it happens when things move or you move quickly. The other aspect can be the neck and the jaw. Often we can have dizziness stemming from a neck or more of a whiplash or a jaw. We can have difficulties falling asleep, staying asleep. Sleep is a very big part of concussion. And one part is the mood piece. You're quick to get irritable, difficulties managing stress, troubles with um, different emotions. So there's a lot to be said that concussion can become where many of these systems all are impacting each other. So to look at a concussion that becomes more persistent really does take a lot of detailed looking at some of these systems, figuring out which ones are involved for each individual. Each person's gonna be different and each person's gonna have a combination of these. A treatment plan for this person really involves looking at each of these facets and making a targeted treatment plan based on each of these symptoms that that person has. Now this isn't just about one physician on our team. I'm involved with kind of starting this process and identifying these, but I'm also not the expert in managing every single one of these aspects. There are medical aspects I look at, but I'm quite fortunate we have a great team at Concussion North where we have athletic therapy, physiotherapy, vestibular, vision. We work on mood peace and cognitive behavior therapy. We work on sleep. So each of these pieces really does need that expertise when you have persistent symptoms. So a treatment plan for individuals with more complex needs is going to involve a team with that expertise to help guide return to school and work and sport and really to truly make sure that each of these systems has fully recovered before we're making return to play considerations. The length of time that someone's in this recovery could vary from a couple months to years, but I think the important thing people need to know is that concussions can be treated, these can recover, and we need to also have treatment available that can treat these because people can Get better, get better, and I expect people will recover from a concussion. Perfect. Thank you very much. 
Paul, a uh, hunter from Rugby Canada. So Rowan's Law is only in Ontario. So what's Rugby Canada doing to, on the national level, to address concussion and maybe more of a kind of prevention side of things? Yeah, sure. So I guess for us, the role of sport is to really look at your sport within. Um, I'm, a, I'm an advocate that our sport has to change. It has to evolve. Um, the way that um, people participated in sport five, ten years ago has changed dramatically. Kids are most certainly bigger, they're faster, they're more interested in their lifestyle, what they're eating, so the hits are getting bigger, the players are able to run, those collisions are changing, but we're probably still trying to play the same game um, in many sports that we played years ago, still trying to apply the same laws or rules to our game. So I, I guess one of the takeaways for sport and prevention is know your sport. If you have areas of your sport where you have an increase in concussion-related injuries, why is that injury happening? And ask those questions. So for example, in, in rugby, we know that um, the tackle is where we see the increased likelihood of a concussion-related injury. So we, we have to look at the tackle and think, what can we do to that? So making some changes to the laws. So when we introduce tackling um, at a young age, we have it below um, the waist, because we know from research that when the um, collision is two people at height or in an upright position, we increase the likelihood of a concussion-related injury. We know across multiple sports, hockey's done some fantastic work changing the rules around body checking. So we know we can uh, adapt the laws or the rules within sport, and then the coaches play a vital role on how they coach as well as what they coach. The other piece that maybe doesn't get talked about is that, and Gord spoke about it in his opening remarks, is the role of the referee or the official in implementing those laws or ensuring that if somebody is on the field or the court, that they don't participate in the sport if they're not prepared to participate in the sport. So there was a clear understanding that maybe somebody shouldn't have been on the, the field. Well, the referee has a duty of care to make sure that everyone on the field is, is safe. So I guess um, one of the focus areas for me that I would recommend for all sports is get to know your sport um, and make changes. Um, embrace the change, because um, the people participating in this sport are changing. Um, so we've got to change with that and not try to do new things with, with old ways. Perfect. Now let's, okay, let's switch to hockey then. Uh, Eric, what would you change about amateur hockey and the development of hockey players in Canada? I think there's been improvement. I just, you know, I look at, I look at the research that Carolyn Emery's done out at uh, University of Calgary, and, and it, it's, it's common sense. I mean, if you take contact out of the game and focus on skating, focus on passing, focus on playmaking and, 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 and the other great things, and hold, it off, hold off as long as possible so that everyone can get through puberty, I think we're going to see a safer game. Um, the, guy, the people that are going to continue on and, 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 uh, and get to midget and maybe you start hitting in midget, those are the ones that, you know, they're, they're going to go on. They're going to play junior at some, at some, some place uh, and have, maybe have aspects of uh, uh, some desires to go further than that. Um, but there's no need to. We're losing kids. Kids are dropping out of hockey because there's hitting uh, uh, when one guy is six foot two when they're 13 years old and the other, the other player is a lot smaller. Um, there's just no need for it. Let's let's focus on let's focus on our skill. Let's focus on our creativity. Let's focus on the other beautiful aspects of hockey and uh, hold off on the hitting. Trust me, hockey hitting is not that hard. It's <laughs> <laughs> you line them up. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. We can teach this very quickly. We can teach both you know to to to, re to hit clean and to receive a, a check. Um, but let's postpone that. We know it, you know it's it's part of the game, but. Let's postpone it as long as we can and, and, uh, and have it there for people that are going to go on later on, uh, different levels later on. Perfect. Okay, um, I'm going to ask the whole questions panel, and whoever wants to pick it up can. So should I get my kids baseline tested for neurological tests? I'm going to grab this. Eric's got it. So this has been brought you know, to the GTHL. To, I'm sure it's been brought around uh, different groups coming in, the, the Barry Minor Hockey, so on and so forth. A kid's brain is changing constantly. So if you're going to run a baseline and you're going to have it in, say, uh, September, I think by November, it's irrelevant. 
it, 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 they come back in and they go to do their testing. Their brain is changing so much, so rapidly at such a, at the young ages that it's just irrelevant to do. So, uh, Dr. Lindros would say, absolutely not. <laughs> And, 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 and you may laugh, but he does have a doctorate. Yeah, true. <laughs> he, 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 Western University gave an honorable doctor, honorary doctorate. It cost me five mil. <laughs> <laughs> so a, 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 an inexpensive honorary doctor. <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe I'll add a, a point to that and then hand it over to others um, just, just to, you know, point out, you know, this is something that's brought quite often to sport organizations and to parents and others. And so it was actually brought to us at Parachute to say, okay, what's the clear message we can get on this? And so we've actually did put out a statement um, together with our partners and with our um, expert advisors from across Canada to say that um, baseline testing is not required, um, as particularly for youth, for the general population. And so leagues and youth sport making baseline testing mandatory um, is not a recommendation that we would make. And the reason is we come back, we bring everything back to the evidence. Um, if we actually look at the research evidence, it, uh, there isn't strong support for this testing's valid validity and for its reliability over time. Not only is the brain changing, um, but it's also, we've, there have been studies showing that the test is not perfect, that the test can be thrown, athletes can underperform. Um, and there are various other clinical reasons for it as well that perhaps Shannon would like to expand upon. I think just uh, the I idea of baseline testing for those who may not know is an idea of doing a test when someone's well, doing a test that could be a neuropsychologic test, there could be other tools that people are doing, and then the idea is comparing test results after an injury happens and then looking to see when that test normalizes back to their baseline. The idea with the, was that that would be able to help make decisions around clearance or when a concussion has fully resolved. Now that's a great idea of a test. The challenge was the research has not supported that it's actually been able to do that. The test was not designed to make return to play decisions or to be able to see when a brain was fully recovered. So I think when you look back, these were invented around 15 years ago, first for the Pittsburgh Steelers. We've evolved a lot clinically in how we assess and manage concussions. Many of us that do manage concussions do not need a baseline test. We need to look at the way some of the signs and symptoms and some of the functional aspects of how the brain works. We can do this with different testing post-injury. If you know how these are in a normal population and you know how this is in an injured population, your experience as a physician can make these decisions when a concussion has recovered and make safe return to play decisions without a baseline. As Eric said, these tests are not valid and reliable over time, and I think it's actually 72 hours from the time a test was done to its reliability can change. So imagine beginning of a season to when an injury happens. The other thing you need to look at is how many kids would be baseline tested. If a whole league did this, the question becomes how many concussions happened of those players in the league? How many of those athletes went on to have persistent symptoms that would end up seeing a physician that might use that information that was done on baseline testing? The OMHA asked me as their concussion advisor to be able to guide them on baseline testing for the OMHA. That was 95,000 athletes currently play under OMHA in Ontario. If we baseline tested 95,000 athletes, if that's the recommendation, at $100 each, you can do the math on how much money would be spent on baseline testing. The number of their injury rate that they had produced at the end of the year was just under 200 kids diagnosed with concussion. While I think that's an underestimate, of those kids, if 25% went on to have persistent symptoms, we may have less than 50 kids that would need to see a physician like myself who would be actually doing more detailed post-injury assessment. So that $9.5 million, when it equates to what's needed, the focus needs to be on the care people need to be receiving when they have persistent symptoms and concussion afterwards. So I think baseline testing has taken a lot of attention away from 
making sure that these kids are recognizing a concussion, removing them from sport, referring them to the right people who need to be following them, and if they are high-risk athletes, making sure that they see people who have expertise in concussion care to help guide their return to play and clearance decisions. And a baseline test is not that tool to do so, but it really is connecting with the right information. Perfect. Uh, now, Eric, we have Rowan's Law now in Ontario, the hit stop sit campaign the, the government's got out. What is next? How do we get the rest of the country to buy into this? Yeah, so I look at, I'm, I'm big on the branding of things, and, and I look at Rowan, the name Rowan, and I want Rowan uh, to be up there in the same way that when you think of an Amber Alert, for instance. Everyone knows what an Amber Alert is. Uh, when you think of concussion, we all have a one-stop shop. Uh, you can Google Rowan, Rowan's Law, uh, and we, we end up on Ontario.ca, and we get all the... Uh, the, the great work from, from Parachute, it, it's all in one, one spot. I think parents that I talk to are confused and they need to have confidence in a site that's, that's government run, um, that, that it's all right there for them. Uh, and I think that if we're gonna do this, there's, why wouldn't we have the same name? Uh, I think it's economical to do the whole country in the same name. You're gonna save money all the way through. Plus you're gonna, it's, it's continuity. It's, it's, it's you know it's right there. It's, there's no reason not to. And as Gord mentioned, you know, yeah, we it is a bit of low lying fruit that we hit, but it's also set a bar that there's no reason every other province territory uh, can't hit that, can't accomplish it in in a 95 percent way. Um, so I think it's a uh, yeah we're, we're we're doing we're doing fairly well here. We're halfway through a little bit of the implementation. We're keeping our foot on on the gas, there's still, there's still a lot of work to be done. Let's not kid ourselves. It's, it's moving along, but it's not where we need to, need to have it. And uh, listen, the more people at the table, the better. Uh, if we're not doing things correctly and you have a better idea in Manito Manitoba, please tell us, let's, let's change this. It's a, it's a living, breathing law. And as we receive more information from uh, the research side of things, we can, we can adapt and change as we, as we go. Perfect. Okay. I've got lots more questions, but I'm going to want to open up to the audience to ask our panel uh, of experts a question. So again, don't be shy. We'd ask you to just direct a question about concussions. Got lots of questions we could ask. Uh, and there's two mics, front, left and front, right. Come on down and ask a question, please. Uh, Watch your step. I have two questions, basically. Um, I'm thinking of the young hockey player, Crosby. How many major concussions would be too many concussions before the sport shouldn't be played anymore? And two, having had three serious concussions myself, and my doctor has said, don't do that anymore. Does the brain actually ever fully recover? Good question. Whoever wants to field it. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> Thanks for your questions. I think those are two really good points. Um, your first question was around the question about retirement from sport and how many concussions is too many. And then your second question was, does a concussion fully recover? So to answer the first question about retirement from sport, there's always been this old adage of three. If you look back, people say, oh, when there's three concussions, that's the magic number. This idea of three is actually not substantiated with any scientific information behind it. You could have one concussion that lasts a year and a half, two years. You could have a concussion that lasts less than a day. So the actual number of a concussion is not really the way we would look at that person's concussion number as being a certain magic number to retire. It does become an individual decision and there are certain criteria that we can look at. Some of that might be ongoing structural brain injury. Is there a brain bleed? Is there an aneurysm? Is there an ongoing fracture of the upper C-spine? Is there something that's structural that's ongoing, that's been diagnosed on an MRI, a CAT scan, that has a structural lesion? The second would be abnormal neuropsychological testing. Has there been parameters in some of the cognition, some of the brain's functioning that would say there's an ongoing injury that might guide that someone doesn't continue in a sport? There's also persistent symptoms. That person's symptoms don't recover, and they have ongoing symptoms that might preclude them going back. 
The other thing we need to think of is that if it does recover, are they getting more and more hits or mechanisms with less force that's causing a significant prolonged recovery? For one example, you could have a football player that plays tackle football, they get a tackle, they may have a concussion that lasts a month, but then all of a sudden when their teammates comes behind them, they fully recover, just taps them on the helmet, and that tap on the back of the helmet led to a month or two month recovery. It'd be very hard to put that person back in a tackle scenario when knowing a light hit is enough to cause persistent symptoms. So I think when counseling from that person's return, there might be other sports that that person does. There might be a very kind of a candid one-on-one -on -one conversation with that athlete about what a return may have the risks of, and you're always looking at a risk reduction point of view. I think the term retire from sport is a hard one, especially for young athletes. So I think it has to be really done with someone who has the expertise of managing concussion to have a candid conversation about the risks. And what that individual decides may be a different decision than what the next player may decide. So a player like Sidney Crosby, who goes back after a year and a half of symptoms, may make a very different decision than someone like me who plays hockey and has a concussion for a year and a half and decides not to go back to hockey. So I think there are some ways to counsel, some absolute risks, but there are some that are a discussion with that person. I don't mean to be long-winded. Your second answer, does someone fully recover from a concussion? I really- Be careful how you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to answer that? <laughs> Dr. Eric, <laughs> go ahead. I think this is all about common sense, really. You know, common sense says if, if, if things are happening and your tolerance to, to, uh, to getting concussions is, is decreased so quickly or is really dropped, don't play. I mean, when was the last time you were on Kijiji and saw a brain? I mean, <laughs> think about it. Really, truly. This is what we're trying to do here is educate people that let's just slow down. Let's just, if something occurred, let's slow down. If there's a hit, stop. Let's think about things. Let's assess and sit if necessary, if, it, if it's time to go see, uh, see a doctor. We're just, we're really trying to push common sense here. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, got a question on the other side. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, first question, does the increased neuroplasticity in young people mean that they recover better or worse from concussions? Another good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Dr. Lindros? <laughs> I'm going better. I don't know. Paul and I talk about neuroplasticity all the time. I'll pass on this um, one. I mean, the, sh the short, I don't know about the neuroplasticity factor. Again, I'll, I'll defer to Shannon's expertise, respecting our own areas of expertise. But um, as Shannon pointed out, the, the typical recovery period for a younger person is actually longer than an adult. So um, in youth under 18, typically we're seeing um, up to a month for a typical recovery or an adult, we're gonna typically see um, up to two weeks. Um, adolescent age is also a risk factor for that uh, physicians will look for, uh, consider in terms of expecting possible prolonged symptoms. Um, and the other thing that's, that's showing too is that uh, females tend to have longer recovery as well. I don't know if you wanna add anything about yeah. the brain science behind that. I would say some of the research that we've been doing is looking at recovery times. What makes someone have a longer recovery time? Female gender, within two months of seeing people in our clinic, 66% of males will make a full recovery. Only 50% of females will make a full recovery in that same amount of time. So there is something to be said with the females taking longer to recover. However, when you look at when that person first sought care, we actually see some significant differences. Taking a young male into a doctor's office, they were showing less number of days from the injury to the time they connected with care versus the time that females were connecting with care was actually significantly longer. So as females, are we not seeking care as quickly? When they balanced out the amount of time between the injury and the first appointment, and took that out of consideration, the actual length of recovery time ended up being nearly equal. So I think there's a couple things to be said. For those patients that we saw that made the quickest recovery, they were people that connected with the right care at the right time by the right providers. And that I mean is connecting with care. Those that took six months or longer to connect with care, 
ended up taking the longest recoveries, at least six months to 12 months, if not longer. So I really think there's the adage of making sure that we get a diagnosis and get connected to the care before these symptoms become too persistent. So if after 14 days, if that person's continuing to have symptoms, that may be prompting the primary care physician to make a referral to a physician who has experience in concussion care with some interdisciplinary team members that may be able to help, which has been shown to reduce recovery time. Second question. Um, when you're looking at a child, it's fair, it, you can get the parent to take them to the doctor or take them to care. When you're looking at an adult who is irritable and saying, no, I'm fine, I don't need to go to the doctor, what are some things that you could say to them to influence them to actually go and get the help, even if they don't think they need it? Great question. Paul, you grabbed your mic so quick, I thought you were all over that. I just needed to occupy my hands, to be honest. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Eric, behave chair? yourself. Um, I guess. Maybe, maybe I'll just I'll try kind of guide that question. There's a, there's a huge piece about education, isn't there? Um, and, and how can we connect with as many people as possible to um, uh, reiterate the importance of um, concussion-related injuries. Um, so why are those people not wanting to come forward and talk? That, that would be an interesting question to ask. But we talked a lot, Gord, on the, the committee about the importance of education. Um, so I, I don't think there's... Well, I don't have kind of um, tools for those people, but I think it heightens the reason why people should go and seek the appropriate medical care from a, a doctor or a, a nurse practitioner. Um, but that was a big passion for us from the, the advisory committee. Eric, what's your advice? Well, there's a team up, speak up, which is something that goes on now with, with a lot of the sports teams where, you know, you, you kind of know who you're playing with, you, you got your teammates, you know what they're like, you know, there's some have, everyone's got different personalities. But if you're noticing something that's off, as a really good teammate, speak up about it. Say something to a coach, say something to, to their parent, or, or, you know, Johnny's off a little bit, or Sarah's, you know, something's, something, why cannot, why can't that occur, I guess, with, uh, with the people that uh, the adult would surround themselves with? I, again, it's just looking out for one another. That's really what it is. One, and, one, and oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Gord. One thing that worked with my in-laws, who are well on in years, um, my father-in-law is a real stubborn old coot, and he doesn't want to listen to his wife. He, she'll tell him to do something. But getting, talking to somebody else, uh, a friend, get a friend to come along, um, you know, somebody else in the family. We found what worked with him was um, having another one of his friends in, in the residence they're in talk to them and say, you know, can you go and talk to Pat and say, yeah, I noticed something. Maybe you should go get something checked out. He was a lot more receptive to that than he was to his wife telling him, or his daughter, my, my wife telling him, you got to go see the doctor, Dad. Yeah, leave me alone. But, you know, maybe it's just a change of the... Um, change of where the information or where the suggestion is coming from rather than, oh, say... Look, you stubborn old coot, get in the car, we're going to the doctor. So, yeah, 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 you know, it's... Yeah. yeah, for sure. Maybe not those exact words, but something like that. Um, yeah, and, and this, this is why we also do focus on policy and working within organizations where you can. Certainly, this wouldn't apply just hanging out at home. But, for example, in sport organizations where we can put policies and protocols and training in place, that helps with this because then it's not... Um, an individual player's decision. There is a bigger policy here. There are people who are designated for responsibility, and actually that choice is kind of taken out of your hands in, in a good way. Um, so, so putting those in place, having people responsible saying, well, we all agreed to this policy. We all signed this document. This is how it goes. Sorry, no choice. Yeah, maybe I'll just add it. I think you're talking culture here. 
and, and changing culture is hard, isn't it? That, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. And things like um, the kind of signs and symbol, symbols that we see around concussion, the importance of communication through the media, that it's not seen as um, a tough up thing and um, going and getting checked out is a sign of weakness. That, that's a culture change. That's going to take time from the ongoing discussions, working with our teammates, our peers, etc., um, to have those discussions and not think that it's a sign of fear um, or a sign of weakness. Um, that should be seen as a sign of strength for somebody to say, yeah, I, I might have something I need to go and get checked out here and, and, and go and check it out. But it's a culture change, which is going to take some time. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, another question. Uh, if I may, I'll stick with the two questions. Um, I volunteer with Minor Hockey. I'm the director of trainers for my association. And I am asked all the time about mouth guards. Are they going to protect my kid's brain or not? What shall I say? Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, looking at the evidence uh, about prevention and mouth guards, um, the evidence is still mixed, so we don't have anything that definitively definitively, sorry, says that um, they do uh, prevent concussion. Um, certainly, they are recommended for um, preventing dental trauma, so that's an important factor. So it's, it's like when we talk about helmets and, and we say helmets don't prevent concussion. I'm not telling you not to wear a helmet. They're important for, they are designed to prevent other things. Uh, that is still being um, explored in the research, but the research right now doesn't say definitively, yes, it, it works to prevent. Yeah, you, you've got to remember the, the biomechanics of concussion. Something between your teeth isn't going to stop your brain from rattling around in your head when you get hit. Um, so there may be some mitigating factors with, with mouth guards, but as far as a preventative tool, the, uh, to me, as a layperson, from what I've learned over the last six and a half years, anybody who's promoting it as a, a concussion thing, that's way out of line. Um, not wearing them might make your orthodontist really happy because they can <laughs> you know, put yeah. some braces on you and do some dental implants and whatnot. But um, yeah. I, Right now, like Stephanie says, any, anything that I've seen or read in the literature, it's not supportive of a concussion prevention tool at this time, the way it, the way it works. Um, I'll share a little bit in rugby. Um, rug rugby's research doesn't support um, concussion prevention in terms of wearing a gum shield. We are about to engage in some research with um, Dr. Caroline Emery from the University of Calgary, where we will research gum shields just because we, we feel it's an area that we just need to look into again. Um, but at this current moment in time, the, the research doesn't support it as a prevention tool. Um, okay. But we're, we're going to have a look at it over the next kind of two years and some research in, in Calgary. What's the downside, though? So the downside is I get parents coming to me and the kids are Timbits and they're three years old yeah. and they're saying, your organization makes my kid wear this and he's choking, he doesn't want to play hockey, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. Got it. We're out of here. Oh, I was, okay. But, so what's the age that you think that kids should start wearing mouth guards? I think as soon as they put their skates on, if they're going to be expected yeah. as they go through to wear the mouth guard, they've got to put the skates on, put the mouth guard in and go out yeah. on the ice. Perfect. That's, if, if it's the rule that we have to enforce, then I sure. think it should be with all the other equipment. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if science doesn't support that, I don't want to be the one standing up here. Yeah, but science doesn't support it yet, possibly. Yeah. Because right? okay, there's TMJ. That. Right. So what's yeah. the downside? Yeah. I get if you're uncomfortable and you're choking and, you know, my three-year-old, if one of my kids were three, yeah, my mm -hmm. one goofball, that was, there's no way he's going to wear a mouth guard. But the other two, yeah, for sure. But, I, I, you know, by the time they're five, for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my second question then is, uh, so I'm a mom of kids in elementary school. I've been on the board of figure skating. I'm now with hockey. And anytime one of my kids gets a concussion, which has happened, I need to tell everyone, and it's not streamlined. When do we think policy will get into the place where there's like one reporting area? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a really that's good a question. That's a great question. And that's one we had at the committee level is um, streamlining the information flow and the information dissemination system. Um, because of the way things are with uh, privacy laws and health care, that's a tough nut to crack. Sure. Um, we think there are probably going to be 
um, like app developments or, or uh, other areas in in the um, that kind of communication where we're going to be able to have like a passport kind of a thing or whatever where that you can carry from sport to sport and you can disclose to the people you want to disclose to and everything. But it is actually one of the items that the, the government has, uh, we've instructed the government to look into is the kind of system where when you get injured in your football game on Saturday and you go to school and you play for your school hockey team, your school hockey coach knows that you were injured in your football game on Saturday uh, and knows that there are certain things you have to avoid or whatever without you necessarily disclosing it directly to them as a player. Maybe it's uh, an involvement of the parents that need to happen or whatever, but there has to be some kind of system where the healthcare practitioners and the coaches are all on the same page for the kids. And, and just to add, from a sport policy perspective, there has been a lot of work underway at the national level. Um, it does take time to uh, work through various levels of sport and education and all of our different jurisdictions we have in Canada. Um, but uh, we've been working with funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada and working with Sport Canada and a number of sports like Rugby Canada and, and about 50 national sport organizations, Hockey Canada as well, um, on what's called a harmonization project to make sure that all of these sports have a concussion protocol that follows the same principles and that's all based on the, the Canadian guideline on concussion and sport, that they're using similar forms, similar education information. So we have started that process, and a lot of national sports like rugby do a really great job of working that information out through their, through their system. Um, uh, it's not perfect, but I do want to acknowledge that there are a lot of partners behind the scenes trying to make that happen, recognizing that challenge, that there's patchwork across the country and communities. Yeah, it's a great question. The piece I would add to it is, um, as a parent, if you're going to put your child into a sport, ask them what they've got in place. You know, if they say, yeah, I've got concussion guidelines in place, ask them how they developed it. If it wasn't aligned with Parachute Canada, don't put your kid in it. It's as simple as that. That's the North Star for us in sport, and it's all about us harmonising to the resource that they've got. So if you're putting your kid into a sport, any age, any stage, any level, and they don't have those um, guidelines in place, and they're not implementing the training or the awareness around signs and symptoms, don't put your kid into that sport. So. Wonderful. Thank you. I love the idea of the passport. I want to be able to go to every coach and just show one thing, so if we can... Yeah. work towards that. Great that would be lovely. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Great question. The last four people that are standing are going to get their questions. We're going to ask them to just do one question, though. <laughs> You're getting cut off. All right. Thank you. All right. My question is for Dr. B, who I'm actually a patient of. Um, I have, uh, it's in regards to a gradual return to work. I know the answer, but I think it's important for anybody. Oh, is that better? So, okay. My question is for Dr. B. Um, I'm a patient of hers, and uh, today was my first day uh, back at work after a four-month recovery uh, concussion program. Um, I thought I know the answer, but I think it's important for anybody that is a boss or uh, has colleagues with um, a concussion uh, that they understand why a gradual return to work is necessary for, I would say, most concussions. I don't know all, but um, just to help understand that, you know what, we don't want to work necessarily two, day, two hours a day for five days a week. That's not ideal for us either. But why it's so important for the brain to have to retrain in that environment. I think you'd be an excellent one to answer that question. So based on what you've learned, what how would you explain the, the importance of what you've gone through and what you would like the employer to know? Because I think you kind of just answered your question you started asking. Okay. Why don't you speak to kind of what you thought? So, basically when you have a concussion, I had, mine was pretty severe, it took four months, not as severe as most, a lot of people, but um, I've had to retrain my brain on absolutely everything. Um, from washing the dishes to doing laundry to being able to talk to multiple people at one time. Um, I'm ear wearing an earplug today just because of all the different stuff going on. Um, so I was able to, over the four months, retrain my everyday life with the four kids at home, a husband that works shift work, um, making meals, planning, figuring out who's picking up the kids from school. Um, and trying to do all of that. Uh, if I overdid it, I would be vomiting for the next day. 
um, or I would be having six hour naps a day, but then still be able to go to bed at eight o'clock at night. Um, so when it came time to be able to go back to work and I had home life, you know, good, I was in a good place, work was totally foreign to my body. Um, so I can't mimic the work that I do at home. I don't have multiple calls, I don't have clients coming in, I'm not pricing, I'm not looking at multiple screens while, screens while I'm answering a phone. Um, there's all these different things that you can't mock at home. So in order to go back to work, it has to be introduced and your brain has to be retrained on to how to be able to sit in a meeting with you know, five project managers and be able to hear what everybody's saying um, and you know, do your job properly. So that's where I'm at now, but it was a tough road because at first, I mean, my employer is awesome, but they, they've never dealt with anybody that had a concussion. So at first it was like, well, no, if you, your job is a full-time job, you can't come back. And it's like, well, I want to come back, but like I'm never going to be able to unless I retrain my brain. So even if, I, even if somebody takes off another six months of work, it doesn't mean that they can still go back in eight hours a day. If I took another six months off, I'd still be in the same position because it's like my whole brain has totally disappeared when it comes to doing work in the workplace. So I just wanted to... You answered it eloquently. Thank you. And I think Thank you. what you've also raised is it's not as simple and you really, you know, you've been able to do well and get back at that and it's gradual and each person's individual and the support's really important. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> And just in this moment of silence, come forward. Um, there is a free um, resource called the Concussion Awareness Training Tool that has a number of modules. One of them is on workers and workplace, if you're interested in free information about that. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about a cultural shift. And I think we need a cultural shift, as Gore talked, in the refereeing. You know, this, the situation with his daughter, I saw a grade nine boy on Monday night that had been, he was playing hockey, grade nine level, and he's got to stop the, on his back, but some kid puts him into the boards and almost knocks him out. Eric knows from, in, from the, during the season to the playoffs in front of the net, it's a totally different war zone. I've got an eight-year-old grandson playing on the cross, and the number two-handers, you think this kid's that are 40, and these kids are only eight years of age. The amount of violence that's allowed in these sports from a refereeing perspective, we're just gonna have more injuries. We can't stop that unless we, we get a cultural shift in that too. Anybody wanna comment on that? Well, I think at, at, the, at the committee level when we were discussing this, we, we put the whole concept of the holistic approach to concussions, the core of it was a cultural change within society. When you look at things like Recycling, drinking and driving, um, anti-bullying that's now big in schools. That's really where it all started was with the kids themselves. So when you have the, the law changes, the rule changes in hockey where they've cut out body checking below 14, that, that's a good start. But as you say, hand in hand with that, you also have to have empowered your officials and have the players and the parents and the coaches understand that those officials have a job to do and they need to enforce the rules. And then the officials also have to take that empowerment and properly utilize it. So there, there's, I, I always, I mean, I'm a, I'm a great hockey fan, but I always cringe in the playoffs when at the end of the playoffs you hear about so-and-so who played with a fractured elbow and so-and-so who played through the playoffs with three broken ribs and they're, and they're all put on this pedestal of being a great warrior and a great, and kids are watching this and going, I have to be, you know, I want to be like that guy. If I want to go and play in the NHL, I got to play through all this stuff like he's played through. And years ago, I probably wouldn't have said this, but now I look at it and I go, is that really a message you want kids to be taking? Is that when they're injured, they shouldn't be looking after themselves? And then you take that a step further. A broken bone is going to heal. 
They're going to put a cast on it. They're, they're, going to, they're not going to be able to play. When you break your brain, you don't see it. It might manifest itself in some symptomologies, but why would you play with a broken brain when you can't even play with a broken arm? What's more important, your arm or your brain? So I, I think that's where the cultural change needs to happen, is that understanding that, you know, I, I always, I, I'm personally bothered by some of the terminology in the concussion area where they call concussion a mild traumatic brain injury. How mild and traumatic end up in the same descriptor <laughs> is just beyond me. So I actually refuse other than when I talk about it this way, <laughs> to even use the term mild traumatic brain injury. Concussion is a brain injury, whether it's one that resolves itself in a couple of weeks or one that resolves itself at six months, the timeline doesn't matter. Your brain has been injured and it will, with the proper help and, and whatever treatment it needs, it will resolve. Whether it ever resolves 100%, I don't know the answer to that. But you will get back to a place where you can function normally. But the whole cultural change around this warrior mentality, this playing through, pushing on, you know, this is, Eric has used an analogy sometimes when I've seen him uh, in different places is, you have to remember for kids as well, that playoff game in that house league, that's their NHL playoff. That's their Stanley Cup game. That's, in, that's really important to that kid. So if you're gonna tell them that they can't play, that's a tough thing to say to a, to a kid who thinks that that's, that's the be all and end all for them on that day. But those are the calls that need to be made, especially when you're talking about an injury to their brain. It's a good question, eh? Like about the referees, and it's probably an area that we, we neglect, to, to be fair. What I would hope is that we do see a shift on to the referees, not to move the focus from anyone else, but to highlight that everyone has a responsibility. So yes, the referee has a responsibility, or the official has a responsibility to manage the game, the coach has a responsibility to prepare the participant in that game, the player. And to go back to Eric's point, why are people playing sport? Camaraderie, fun, teamwork, these are some of the principles. They ain't playing it to get hit. They're stopping playing the game. So I think we all have a responsibility in that game and not to change that focus to say, referee will just apply rules and laws. And each sport's a little bit different, Doug. I mean, rugby's invested. They realize that they if they don't make that, they're in. They're they're they totally in. But if you look at soccer versus rugby. Rugby made all kinds of great changes. So let's you know what? So let's expose them. Yeah. Where are they? Enough of this. Why not? Good. Applaud those that are doing great work. It's not. I mean, it's hard work, but he's you know they're making changes in rugby. The rest can follow suit. Or are or you going to see it? And, and who's going to sign up for for your nine-year-old uh, or eight-year-old uh, lacrosse? They're going to stop playing. Everyone, you know, sign up levels are going to go down, and before you know already, it. But they're already hurt. That's the problem. That's yeah, and, and it's already happening. People do not want to participate in sports like that. And who wants to put their kid into that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, we got in a bit of a rage there, eh? <laughs> well, it was one of the circles earlier. <laughs> okay. Okay. My Get off the horse. <laughs> Next. Next question, go ahead. I have a question for Dr. B. So um, you had mentioned ligament cruciate and possible C-spine injury. Um, in regards to that, if there's medical testing and imagery that have been um, done and tested and everything shown negative, do you have a neurological doctor that you work side by side in order to kind of um, detect injuries that are more far gone past a concussion, right? Sorry. Are you asking about a structural injury or a functional neurologic exam? Neurological, yeah. So right. I've had neurological testing and um, everything is coming back negative. It's MVA related, um, so it's not, it's, there, it's not sports related, but would you um, do neurological testing to determine whether it's C-spine or ligament cruciate or would you, if it's um, negative testing, MRI-based, uh, neurological, would you just determine it's a like regular concussion and kind of do your testing based on that? 
I guess I would approach each patient a little different, looking at what's their symptoms, what do they still have, what's their specific triggers. Then I would look back to see what functions on my exam support those symptoms. Okay. It could be the neck, that could be one part of the exam. When you're talking about ligamentous, you're looking at, you know, obviously stability different of the neck. You might look at different muscles that are getting triggered with motion. You might be looking at whiplash. That could be one aspect. Okay. On a bit more detailed neurologic exam, that's something that I usually do myself. It takes a pretty extensive amount of time to do, to do well, but you may end up looking at some specifics with how the eyes are focusing on near vision, how they're working together, what you do when you start moving the eyes through what we call as pursuits, what happens as you start adding saccadic eye motions. There's a lot more detail that's specific to brain injury. You might pick up on subtle signs that could tell you that there's a functional injury. So if you were going to go through kind of that approach, you might then be testing vestibular balance, cerebellar functions. You might be testing more on motor and gait pattern. You might put them through some neurocognitive testing to test different realms of reaction time, visual processing speeds. Some of those more detailed might be warranted. If you are doing comprehensive testing, you might put them through some functional testing on an exercise bike, see how their heart rate responds. There's specific patterns that are kind of more a sign of a concussion, how the heart rate goes up with exercise or how it blunts. So some of the different testing you're gonna do with vestibular, vision, autonomic, neuropsychologic, in addition to neurologic, in addition to neck, would all need to be done before you exclude a concussion. Perfect. So irrespective of the mechanism, whether it's motor vehicle, whether it's sport, if you've been asked to exclude that there are signs or symptoms, I think it would have to be a very detailed approach before you could say there's no concussion present. There might be also excluding structural injury if the exam neurologically supports that. I know that's a long-winded answer, but I think many times people say, oh, you're fine, it's not a concussion, but there might be some subtle signs that it is. Or you can exclude and say it's not a concussion, it's something else medical. It could be a coexisting other medical condition that might give the same overlap of symptoms that's not concussion. So I think you're, the question would need someone with that level of expertise to do that assessment. And that is something, though, in office you guys would potentially work with? That's something we do. I'm a sports doctor, so I'm a, I see sports-related sports concussion. Related. That's my scope of practice. But there are other physicians, sometimes uh, neurologists, physiatrists, neurosurgeons, that might do that for other populations. Is there a difference, though? Is there a difference? Uh, yeah, sport relative to, to yep. I mean, is Depends there, on your college and your level of training. So I'm under the primary care college of physicians, family physicians. I did a focused practice in sports medicine. So my training is the care of athletes. So I look at sideline management. I look at specific other things in addition to concussions. But my focus is all sports injuries. Could be looking at Eric's knee or his ankle or his shoulder. The next day I might be seeing Paul for a sports concussion. So my realm of training is a specific focus practice. So certain physicians yeah. would handle it differently then? It may be similar, but their scope and their licensure might be different. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, next. Um, four weeks ago I fell, broke my wrist, um, I had a concussion. You know, nurses are the worst patients, right? So you wait, you don't realize that you have any issues. Two days later, headaches, not feeling good, saw my family physician, <clears throat> was officially diagnosed. What I'm asking is, in emergency, I told them I fell, I had a big goose egg. I feel like, uh, and I work in the hospital, like I said, I'm a registered nurse, I feel like because it wasn't sports related, they're not aggressive. The, the concussion care was not aggressive, the physician was not aggressive. He's like, you know, go rest for a few weeks if you don't feel good. Then we'll see if we can get you into like a concussion rehab. And yet, yeah, I have kids. My son has had a concussion in the past, and right away they picked him up, assessed him, fixed him, sent him for what he needed, had treatment. Is, is there a way that we can ask our health system 
to address the people that are not in the in the sports field that have gotten hurt with a concussion, but like this lady or like myself that, you know, it's a fluke, I fell, I hit my head, I landed up with a concussion. I still have issues, but it, we're not aggressive. We're not, we're not pushing people to help people that are not in the sports field. Great question. Uh, I just want to start by saying thank you for raising that and, and to pinpoint that falls are actually the number one cause of a concussion in Canada. Sport are not the number one cause of concussion. So you are among many others, so you bring, raise a very good point and thank you for highlighting that. Um, I, I almost wonder if, if to put Chris on the spot to speak a Wait little a bit about, That's not fair. Uh, just, just to, I think, I think yeah. the first part is to address yeah. um, seeking emergency care mm -hmm. versus other primary care as, as a first part of that. Yeah, so I, it's a great question and then to, you know, you came to emergency appropriately because you had an injury that you broke your wrist, you had a head injury, we have to rule that you don't have a bleed in your head and we use certain not rules for that. whatsoever. People yeah. And my head, didn't even ask me if I had a headache, nothing. Yeah, so that's, that should have been done and I think that it goes back to education for, for even us. So, so trauma physicians like myself, you know, we, we didn't get good training in concussions because it wasn't, it was not a big deal. You gotta worry about the big bleeds and the gunshots to the head. The broken and, wrist. But these are the more common and the more debilitating, like your wrist yeah. may heal before your brain heals. That's exactly what my family physician said, yeah. yet he's still not aggressive. Yeah. So I think that that's an education piece on our end for the, the, the hospital of physicians and family physicians to recognize them and realize there is an, you know, a sense of an urgency, not necessarily emergency, but urgency to get these, to get people like yourselves, patients into the, uh, the system, into specialized clinics because like, yeah, you're not going to go back to play sports, but you've got to go back to work. You've got to raise kids. You got to do all these things. So it's going to fall on us to educate the non-sports specialists and, and, and concussion specialists to learn more about it and to, to and to streamline these pathways. Uh, and that's on us. I'm still confused. Okay. Because I is have to put... Is there a difference between... <laughs> <laughs> there is a... But, but there's a difference I, in I, care. I'm lost. Absolutely. Yeah. There's 100% a difference in the care between a person that played a sport and got a concussion and a registered nurse that fell and hit her head. The, yeah. difference, the care is not the same. I, I think that's a, a really valid point that we're making here, though. The, our brain doesn't that determine the difference between the sport. not be the same, but the, the concussion itself. The concussion is yeah. the same. Yeah. The would, we would, everyone would be treated the same. Would yeah. it, should it, should, I agree. Uh, yeah. The post care from I, the physician point of view, yeah. from the emergency point of view, the mentality and the thinking. <clears throat> I believe is, oh, this is a sports person. We want to get them back on the ice. We want to get them better. They had a concussion. They have, they're young. Oh, this is somebody in their 50s. Oh, she'll do fine. Just go rest for a little while. Your head will get better. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get better. It's five weeks. It's not better. Mm -hmm. I think like, you've made such a good point that all patients who have head injuries need care. And I think this is so something that I've been... physicians? And I don't know, yeah. like, working in that field myself, yeah. how do I... H how do we make them more accountable? Who's the best non-sport person? Who's your... I've been pushing really hard here in our area, and what I'm going to say is, yes, I'm a sports physician and I see sports injuries. We need a regional concussion center here. We treat a large number of injuries. It's not that care for motor vehicle, WSIB, sports, falls at home intimate partner violence, there is falls in the elderly, there are so many people that need care. The challenge is, and part of things that are happening through efforts like Rowan's Law, is one to say we need a plan for how government is going to help put these type of regional centers in place. We have regional centers for stroke, we have regional centers for cardiology, we have regional centers for cancer, we do not yet have regional centers for brain injury and concussion to have a center that has the physician expertise, has nurses, has occupational therapists, athletic therapists, the support people need, it needs to be in a center like a regional center that can treat all types. There may be multiple physicians in this vision I have that aren't just people that see sports, but all people who need care need a place. I keep lobbying and pushing very hard. I'm sitting on Health Quality Ontario right now I sit on every guideline committee we have in Ontario. Everyone's heard me say this, but I hear you. It really is important, and I keep pushing to say we really do need a funded regional center that has the resources for people who have brain injuries and head injuries, irrespective of cause. I was off for two years with a concussion. You may not know that, but I completely left my medical practice from a collision I had playing hockey. When I was well enough to start going back to work, 
During those two years, I didn't get the care I needed. I, as a physician, integrated in the medical community. I waited 18 months for an opinion to see a specialist. I sat at home and looked out my window every single day. I couldn't work. I couldn't take care of my daughter. My husband could probably say I wasn't making good meals either. Yeah. Um, but my point being, when I was well enough to go back, I thought, I've now gone through a recovery. I myself sought out treatments and tried to put together a care team because it didn't exist. When I was well enough to go back, I created Concussion North myself with no funding wow. because my thoughts were, I want to create a place where people can come, a one-stop shop for all the expertise they need in concussion, but I fully self-funded it without any funding because I felt it was something we needed. That's been now five years, and we've probably been able to help about 750 patients that wouldn't have had care otherwise, but I'm one person with a great team, but we have no funding. So it's a big initiative to say, you know what, this is needed. I'm helping in the niche that I can help, but I also am very, very passionate to say people need care in addition to the kind of care we've been able to create. But I think our clinic and what we've created has helped lead some of the work on the Canadian guidelines, the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation guidelines, advisor to the federal government on the care that's needed. I've been able to use our model as an example of what needs to happen for concussion and brain injury across the province and Canada to make that happen. I just need to be able to have the support behind it to help that happen. So uh, I commend you because it's phenomenal. I wish there were more. This was. This was something, again, that was also recognized at the committee level. And, and part of it does go back to um, what Dr. Martin said, was it was the education piece. And part of some of the recommendations are that healthcare professionals upgrade. Okay. There, there should be, uh, our, our frontline family physicians should be able to triage and handle on their own about 60 to 70 percent of the cases. There should be, and, and, and I've held up Shannon's practice as an example, I've held up the Pan Am Clinic in Winnipeg, I've held up various clinics that exist in Toronto, the, the Children's Concussion Clinic in Ottawa. There are examples of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary care centers that exist now. <laughs> they need to be supported and they need to be replicated by government. They do. And it, it's, it's, always, it's always hard getting government to commit money to something. We're going to hold them to account on what they're supposed to deliver here. But what we really need is... Uh, I don't want to, like I hold my one example that I have, I marched into my MPP's office and I said, I've got this and I don't want it ignored. Tell me how to make it happen. That's what we elect these people for. They're down in Queen's Park in Toronto to serve their constituents. So you go in there and you say, I know what Rowan's Law and the Rowan's Law Committee said, you're supposed to be um, educating your medical professionals. You're supposed to be getting these people extra training. You're supposed to be looking at your OHIP funding models so that these people get the support. What are you doing? Put the pressure on them. They will listen. Uh, it, we wouldn't have gotten Rowan's Law through just me marching around screaming and yelling wouldn't have I had there were so many people that got on board and if we want to keep this thing going and we want to keep driving them and keeping their feet to the fire that's what we need get to your MPP's office write them letters get on the phone be a pain in the ass <laughs> but uh, it, no it, it it it's it's true they answer to their constituents uh, I, I learned something at at the federal level that we kind of operated on, our communications people operated on. And they said, they always said, one letter from somebody to them represented the voices of 200 people in the public. Because they figured one person who had 
the gumption to put some pen to paper probably represented 200 people in the general population. So that's a rule of thumb I look, I look for. So if your MPP gets 100 letters saying, Do something. <laughs> what are you doing about this? What are you, what, what, what's happening on this file? Get to work. That's going to represent a lot more than 100 people in their mind. Um, I know it's not an answer for you because this is something that's going to happen. It, it has to happen over time. I can tell you that discussions I've been in at the, at the government level, the idea of overlaying or, or using um, the stroke network, the cancer network, et cetera, as kind of a template for concussion care is already in it's in the minds of people. We have this thing that's out there. How can we overlay other things on top of it and, and make it work the same way or, or, or gain the benefits of it? So there are those discussions happening. I'm hoping that before my time on this planet is over, I'm going to see something that's, that, that is like that because we have excellent examples. You don't have to go out and create these, these nodes, these okay. wheels. They exist. You just have to support them and replicate them. So stop wasting your money on whatever it is you're wasting your money on. This stuff is working, and people need this. So just just replicate it. That's all they need to do. And uh, you know, I I have so much respect for Shannon and for what she's done um, of her own volition. Uh, yeah, that's pretty incredible for somebody to make that kind of a commitment. And um, she, need, she needs to be supported by the government and, and, and the community because what she's doing is excellent and it should be held up as, as a model for, uh, for the rest of Ontario as to how things need to be done here. You guys are very lucky to have this clinic I in your area. Because I'm not from here, I'm from Sudbury. So. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have to wrap up the question period now and, and finish up. Before we do, I do want to uh, bring up Dr. Bowman. If, if anyone else has questions, maybe we can come up after, if that's okay. Or do we, 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 we got one more. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm the <laughs> mean guy. Please, please go ahead. No problem. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned that there is an interdisciplinary approach, and um, you mentioned um, the, the specialized eye, eye doctor and, and such. Um, do, you, do you also um, include, like, nutritionists? Do you um, look at, like, a, a, a more holistic approach? Um, because we know that there are certain... Um, you know, foods that can worsen neurological inflammation and that sort of thing. Um, so I just wondered if um, some of these multi multidisciplinary um, clinics are also looking at um, these, these types of um, supports. We do have a sports nutrition registered dietitian that does work within our clinic, and there are some of those needs of our patients where it's great we have someone with that expertise. We also do work with a Dr. Larry Comer who works with some of the hormone pituitary aspects and some of the things that he's been able to do um, under his work and research, so he does offer some of that care to some of our patients as well. But you're right, it's, it takes a whole network to manage these patients, and there's a lot of aspects. Depends what the patient presents with and what care they need. We try to connect them with, with what would be best to help them get to the next step of their recovery. Um, yes, and I, and I also noticed that um, you, you talk about residual effects. Like our 17-year-old had um, a series of what we, call, what we were told were mild concussions. But now I find that he is experiencing things like sleep, um, sleep issues, mood disorder. You know, um, he just kind of like personality changes. And but the thing is, like, how do you even know that this is? Um, you know, I'm making that assumption that it's related to the concussion, but it could be like you know, he's, he's a teenager, <laughs> you know, um, hormones are kicking in and the defiance is kicking in, but you know, like, um, how, how can we, um, help our kids to, you know, like fully recover, like you're, um, able to help your patients? 
I think you're asking the right questions, and I think it starts with a question. You're wondering, is this normal behavior for a child this age, or could this be related to the concussion? So I think you keep asking those questions. Start with the primary care physician. If the person's young enough, they may be under pediatrics, and maybe they make a referral to have somebody look specifically at those aspects. Maybe that primary care physician has some ideas to either reassure you or to also kind of listen to your questions you have and explore that a bit further. I think keep asking the question. If you have concerns, you know your child better than anyone else, and I think it's important to follow up on those questions you have.